Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. I try in patients who have chronic refractory ITP to find a strategy that reduces the use of long-term immunosuppression, uh, but in an effort to also find the minimum doses of medications that, that um, are required. Now, in a younger patient, I'm willing to try at least one or two um, agents after they failed primary treatment, which is corticosteroids and intravenous hemoglobin. And that would include, in many cases, uh, anti-CD20 therapy. Now, I always inform these patients that using anti-CD20 therapy, such as rituximab, only results in about an initial response of about 60%, but only half of those have normal platelet counts. The patients who do not maintain a normal platelet count, all of them relapse with a year, and there's no advantage of, of repeating this intervention. If at one year they have a normal platelet count, and that's about 30% of individuals who are treated with rituximab, if they have a normal platelet count one year, I tell them they have a two out of three chance at five years of remaining in remission unmaintained. We don't have data beyond five years, but in a paper by Patel, in blood, the, about 21% of adults treated with rituximab are in remission, have a maintained a safe platelet count, and most of these are normal platelet counts at five years. So it's a one in five chance. Most young individuals are willing to try that because there's reasonably good data that there isn't significant long-term sequelae of the treatment. The side effects are not severe, uh, except in the occasional infusion reactions. Now, there are some newer therapies that combine anti-CD20 therapy with pulses of dexamethasone. Now, we don't do this, although, again, um, in some of my colleagues in my own institution have chosen this pathway based upon some preliminary results that suggest that if you combine pulse dexamethasone with anti-CD20 therapy, you increase the toxicity, there's no doubt about that. You increase the risk of infection even, but you have probably uh, close to um, uh, 50 to 60 percent of individuals at one year who have a normal platelet count. We don't again have long-term follow-up, and there is some suggestion that as you get out towards three to five years, um, that a lot of that benefit is lost and you're down to about 30 percent of individuals who are in remission. So it, it, we don't really know for certain, but some people to avoid splenectomy are more willing to try these interventions. I never consider splenectomy in an individual who's received anti-CD20 therapy until a year afterwards because I can't immunize them within six months to a year. Okay. Even though the antibody levels are normal, they are, their ability to be immunized um, is um, much less. Sometimes if I consider this, I do recommend consideration of immunization before we use anti-CD20 therapy, but many of these patients are also on corticosteroids at the same time, so the efficacy of immunization is less. My approach for treating chronic refractory ITP depends on the patient. And this, this is less common than it, than it was uh, before the thrombopoietin receptor agonists, which really rescue quite a few patients that we used to call refractory ITP. But that being said, there's still some patients who don't have optimal responses even to the thrombopoietin receptor agonists. So in those cases, I use combination therapies, uh, usually with thrombopoietin receptor agonists. And again, several, uh, several People who treat a lot of ITP de depend on their own favorites, but uh, I often use perhaps a thrombopoietin receptor agonist along with either cyclosporin or uh, mycophenolate mofetil, sometimes with some steroids, sometimes with some dapsone, maybe with some imuran or vincristine given in there. And oftentimes these combinations will have some success, uh, even in the most refractory ITP patients. But there's many abstracts and 
small case series you can find with various regimens in small numbers of patients that have had good success. I don't think there's any one that's better than any other. Um, and again, a lot I think depends on what the patient tolerates, what the physician's comfortable with. I think once you get to using these, it's probably worth referring a patient to somebody who treats a lot of ITP uh, because it's something that you just don't see very much uh, unless you, this is one of the diseases you focus on.